Okay, so this is Jacob. He's 22 years old. He's um, my son. And um, for a really long time, for a really, really long time, we've actually had this idea that Jacob should have a good life included in the community as an active and valued citizen. And I suppose what's particular about this is that we know that for people with disabilities, this doesn't happen just by accident. It actually requires, as Lorna said, a vision and a concerted action to make it occur. So that's sort of, I suppose, where we start is that, you know, we want Jacob to have a good life. We want him to have a fabulous life. And whether you call it a dream, an aspiration, and goals and aspirations is the language of the NDIS, or a vision, we believe that Jacob's entitled to the same typical good life that most people enjoy. So now Jacob... Um, <laughs> that's, okay. that's okay. Um, <laughs> so Jacob, um, he's, um, he's got pretty uh, significant uh, level of... Um, of, of disability, he's uh, he he um, he's well. I should talk about what Jacob does a little bit. So, um, some of the things that Jacob's involved in is that um, he's um, a member of uh, Toastmasters at the university, and he's really getting into um, public speaking. And I think that um, this is one of the, those things which just comes up, and it's one of the most unlikely things, but something that Jacob's just really really enjoying. Um, he's uh, He's got two voluntary jobs. He um, is the assistant treasurer to the PNC at his old primary school and he's got a job at the local pub um, with their social club. He, um, he's starting to go to the beach now the weather's warmed up. Jacob does not like cold water and cold days, but now that the weather's warmed up, that he started going, started going to the beach and um, there's a power wheelchair at one of the beaches and um, Jake's been using that to burn along the beach. There's a big stretch of beach in Newcastle and, and Jacob's getting in the power wheelchair. Now he needs assistance to do that. He's not able to drive it himself but quite liking that sensation. It's a bit like a dune buggy, you know, from Cook's Hill to down to Merriwether and back. It's really good to watch him doing that. Um, but the thing is that Borrowing that chair that belongs to the surf club, Jacob's getting an in to the surf club. He's getting to know the people at the surf club and we're sort of just starting to think about what roles Jacob might have at the surf club. What can, where can he fit in there and start to really get to know people and really get to make some great connections? Because that's what it's all about. We're all about finding those roles Jacob can have where he can meet people who have similar interests to him, the beach, talks, public speaking, and he can get to know those people and, um, and you know, start to make connections and friendships because that's how we all do it. You know, we sort of meet somebody and, you know, we might sort of meet a few times and kind of go, yeah, you know, we're both interested in the same thing. And, and it's just harder when people have a disability and it just requires a lot more concerted effort. Um, Jake requires a high level of support um, and we use a combination of um, informal or freely given supports and paid supports. And I think that's really um, important as well that, you know, we're talking about paid supports today, but it's the freely given ones which really, you know, make our life really work for us as well. So um, what we believe is vital though is that the people who are supporting Jacob share our vision for a good life for Jacob that they actually can work towards achieving that vision, work towards achieving his goals. And we believe that is vital. So that being vital, we've always, um, when we've been using services, we've always sought to recruit our own support workers. So um, the NDIS came to town not last year, but up until us joining it, Jacob, we had a, it was called self-management. The language is so confusing. In New South Wales, self-management up until the NDIS meant that a service provider held the funds on your behalf and you, it was a sh more of a shared management arrangement that CAF detailed. Um, so we had a service provider who would allow um, me to recruit support workers for Jacob and um, manage train. I recruited, I trained and supervised the support workers who worked with Jacob and essentially the service provider was a financial intermediary. We sent timesheets off to the service provider and they pi paid the support workers. The support workers had minimal engagement with the service, which was really, really good. Um, 
In fact, you know, one of our support workers, we often employ young people who are Jacob's age who are going to uni. And one of our support workers, Alicia, she, she graduated uni and got a job in northern Queensland. And we had to say goodbye to Alicia. And I was just sort of going like, have you resigned from the service? Who? The service. The people who pay you. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. So, so that's that's sort of a you know a bit of an example of of how how little that involvement they had in their, her, in, in the day to day running of um, Jake's support, I suppose. Um, but even though I don't have very many complaints about the service, actually, you know, I think that shared management actually worked really, really well in a lot of ways. They they paid the bills. They they charged us you know percentage of the funding to handle the financial intermediary aspects. Um, of Jacob's support, and you know that that worked reasonably well. Occasionally, would butt up against the, the 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 boundaries of what they would allow. Not very often, um, but you know, there's it's just a little, you know, occasional, you know, yeah, gripes. I suppose not gripes even. It's not even as severe as gripes, but just I sometimes started to think that maybe I could, you know, we paid them a fair bit in um, administration, and I thought maybe I could use that money more effectively. And I thought, well, with the NDIS there's an option for direct payment, so maybe I'll try it out. Um, and it can be really, really hard to, so I suppose essentially what we did with the direct payment is we decided to directly employ support workers. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it is at that far end, I suppose, of level of choice and control. And as Lorna said, it comes with its challenges, and it, there comes with you know reasons to be cautious about it. Um, and people can get can be really find it hard to get their head around it. But actually, in some ways, it's more simple because you're cutting out the middleman. So I'm doing something similar to Kath in that um, Catherine, who spoke before, um, in that I receive a direct payment, but instead of engaging a service provider, I'm the employer, and I have some additional responsibilities. But one of the interesting things is, even by taking on more, I actually get to do less. I actually have more freedom to delegate than I had when I was using a service. Um, so, okay. So, in some ways, I think it's the most straightforward way of doing things. You sort of don't have that middleman. So, if the next slide. The reasons why we do it is because it is a totally individual approach. It is totally, totally centred on Jacob. And you can't be more, you couldn't be more person-centred than we are, I don't think. It's really, really flexible to Jacob, uh, really, really around Jacob. It's flexible and responsive to Jacob. And we can be really, really quick. There's a band playing down the road on a Wednesday night. Jacob, you know, and it's Wednesday afternoon. We can very quickly often organise paid support for Jacob to go and see the band. And sometimes it's informal support as well that can support him in those situations. Um, I suppose the thing that I find about it is, is that um, we don't have to, um, I suppose it's, it's centred around Jacob so that, I suppose it's the next slide I think. So, um, so it's, um, we employ the people so the, they're, they're responsible just to us. There is no divided loyalty. So sometimes I, th I think this is actually the key when you recruit your own support workers and they don't engage with the service and don't work with other families with the service. I think you actually get greater loyalty. I suspect, I don't know, have, there's no, you know, but I find that our support workers have been incredibly loyal. In fact, there was never a question when we switched from, um, because I'd recruited the support workers, I had no concerns about bringing them with us to the, the direct employment um, model and um, none of them had any concerns about not, you know, sticking with the agency. Um, the policies and procedures are really sort of tailored around uh, Jacob's needs and circumstance. So um, I suppose this is sort of just, you know, sometimes we, you find the, the, the barriers of um, the support services that, you know, uh, a while ago, um, uh, last year, Jacob's support workers got an email or a, a letter from the service saying that they weren't allowed to use social media at work and they could be fired for using social media at work. You know, and, um, and uh, of course, Jacob's, uh, Jacob uses social media quite often when he's out and about. Facebook, you know, you, you, you know I, I'm at the beach, I'm going to show everybody I'm at the beach and my life is really cool. And Jacob's support workers will assist Jacob doing that. And then they might even share it through their Facebook networks as well. 
So actually not being allowed to use social media at work was a bit of an issue, it's a small issue, but it was just, you know, a poly, a the service provider has, was responding to a, an issue in their group homes where staff were going on to Facebook at 8 o'clock in the evening rather than doing their job. So they did a blanket approach as opposed to something that was nuanced and specific to the situation. So for us, I thought, you know, when we have policies and procedures and ways of doing things, that it's actually really around Jacob. It's not around anybody else. It doesn't have to be around anybody else at all. We're really able to find creative solutions to support needs as well. We actually blend a lot of informal support and formal support. Um, and that means that, um, you know, friends and family might be working beside or might be supporting Jacob beside a paid worker, um, particularly at times when there is, um, there's a need for uh, more intensive support, say, for example, going swimming where he just the actual physical aspects of it require two people to support Jacob. It's really, really cost and time efficient. As I said before, cutting out the middleman has strangely <laughs> been really, really, um, has enabled me to delegate more. But cutting out the middleman has meant that we can actually make really, really substantial savings in Jacob's support costs. And I just believe that we can use that money more effectively. Particularly, we use that money, um, the, the savings that we make by directly employing in actually having t training that's tailored to Jacob and tailored to our vision for Jacob. So, for example, we, all our support workers, all Jacob's support workers undertake social role valorization training. It just helps them get their head around what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve with Jacob. Jacob um, isn't, uh, Jacob uses a, um, uh, he's, he, Jacob's not able to, to speak, but he, he talks using a communication book and our Jacob's support workers get training in using um, aided communication. So that's just one way that um, we actually really sort of, I think we make much better use of the, the funding. Um, previously we'd have to trade support time to actually have support workers attend that training or pay for it ourselves. Um, we can delegate more tasks. I think the thing that I've really found really interesting is that, um, as I said, I've, I'll, I'll demonstrate in a moment how we've delegated more tasks, and um, I think that by you know we've able to be we've been able to delegate more tasks, which means I have less to do by taking on more responsibility. I have less to do, and I'll demonstrate that in a second. The final thing is that we're voting with our feet. We've got a vision for Jacob, and you know we, as I said, we believe it's important that everyone supporting Jacob upholds that vision and works towards Jacob achieving that vision, and. Um, the service provider that we're using, and most service providers, provide our service provider, yes, it's yes, yes, Linda and Lin Jacob's family will let you self-manage, but over here, and, you can, and Jacob can be included in the community and can have um, valued roles and be, you know, having an interesting good life, but over here we've still got people in group homes and day programs who are very, very excluded. So I'm being quite controversial here, but I actually decided on principle that if the service is, uh, is continuing ongoing to provide segregated congregative services, then are they only playing lip service to our vision? And I think that when it came down to it, I thought if some things go wrong and suddenly the service provider gets control, where, where will that leave Jacob? So that was just one of the reasons why um, we decided to, to go with self-managed. The other thing I probably left it out at the top, it's not just... Um, I think that Lorna made a really important point about bringing people around you and not being isolated. Jacob, um, Jacob's not um, able, Jacob plans his day, he's quite able to plan his day, but he finds it very, very difficult to think about that big picture things. And so we talk about, I've been talking about our vision for Jacob. Um, we brought together a circle of support when Jacob was leaving school. And that's what we might call our nearest and dearest, or Jacob's nearest and dearest. And it's a group of people who've known Jacob for quite some time and who love and care for him, care about him. And um, they're, our, they, they're the people who, you know, come together with us and support our vision for Jacob and support it becoming enacted. So um, I think that I just wanted to mention that. I probably should have done it in the first, first bit, so sorry about that. Um, so there's, there's some of the reasons why we direct our support, Jacob's support. I suppose... Um, I can demonstrate how we do it. I think that's probably the easiest way of doing it. So the next slide. So it starts with Jacob. He's the centre. It's all about him. The support is for him to have a good life. 
It's for no other reason for ja that, but, that for Jacob experiencing a good life as an active and valued citizen. The support, so Jacob, our vision is that Jacob's included in the community. And as I said, some of his roles there are there. Um, I just, um, I'll talk to, tell you a little bit about um, one of the roles he's got is um, public speaking. And he's now um, an active member of uh, Toastmasters. Um, a few months ago, earlier in the year, Jacob was asked if he would like to speak at, the, uh, at a conference uh, in Newcastle. And, um, and it was about decision making. So I had to let Jacob make his own decision about it. <laughs> and, um, and Jake's never done any public speaking, and, and particularly for a person who's using, um, you know, who struggles with communication and who uses aided communication, um, you know, it was, you know, I wasn't sure if it'd be something that he'd be up for. It's certainly not something that we had in thought about that Jacob might be interested in. But I asked him, and he's sort of like, I don't know, what do you, what do you mean? And I thought, well, sometimes before you get up and start speaking to people publicly, you, you join Toastmasters. <coughs> and you build your skills and find out if you like it. Um, but it was really interesting because Jacob's sort of just like quietly, sort of chest puffed out, just a s small smile about doing it. And it's just, I think one of the things where it's that opportunity for a valued role just sort of seemed to pop up and we sort of ran with it. And I think that's sort of, you know, in a way, how your vision sort of continuously evolves. It's not something that's set in concrete. It's something that sort of moves with the rhythm of your life but it's always sort of aspirational and something always you want to move forward to. And also, go, also once again, based on what can, you know, beyond, you know, what was Lorna's phrase? Uh, sensible, re sensible, no. Sensibly unrealistic, I love that, thank you. It was sensible being sensibly unrealistic. Um, so, you know, I just love that. So, you know, this, these are just more opportunities for Jacob to cement and, you know, to create and, and cement connections um, and develop friendships with people in the community. So this is, this is the aim of it all. This is where we start. And sometimes you don't even need support. You know, you, just, sorry, you don't need funding. Sometimes the vision starts and you don't, you don't necessarily have, you have to be on the NDIS to start doing this. You start, you, you start with your vision now. But as it, are, we, as it is, we're talking about the NDIS, so the next one, please. Starts with, with us, for us, there's a direct funding package, which is, next one goes directly to me in a separate bank account, of course, and, um, and I then delegate <laughs> to a bookkeeper who looks after the payroll and the um, uh, payroll and the, the workers' compensation and the taxes and the, all those boring things um, <laughs> that need to be done as a legal requirement. You know, and um, we, he, my, my bookkeeper is a friend, and he'd never done this before. He was a small, he'd run small businesses before, but he's certainly never done this before. Um, and he, um, he, you know, really, really enjoyed working this out. You know, it was something. So we, we actually were sort of finding our own way of doing it. Um, so you know, he really had a good time working that out. Um, of course, we also make substantial savings. We come in much like there's the NDIS. I don't know if you, the NDIS has a benchmark for each hour of support, and we make substantial savings. So with those savings, I, one of our support workers is the support coordinator. So she's actually taken over a lot of the role I had with doing rosters, you know, verifying timesheets. Um, if someone's sick, they contact our support coordinator. Um, she's a particularly gifted social connector and she shares her skills and know-how with the support workers. I suppose when we're employing support workers as well, we're looking at people who have skills in social connection, who just have those really good skills who can go do break the ice and, Jacob, this is Fred, you two like the beach, you might like to chat to each other. So, you know, so she, so um, the support coordinator, she's, she's able to help support workers do that and we recruit, recruit support workers who, who are good at that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, and their support workers get on with the job of connecting Jacob to the community. So that's just basically how we do it. And, it, and I think, it, I'm hoping that I've explained that okay. It's, it can be really hard to get your head around. And certainly, we found it difficult in the first instant to sort of work out how we're going to do this in the context of the NDIS. Um, 
But it, it is actually straightforward. In some ways, we've just taken away the middleman. So the middleman would probably sit below me, or the funding would go to the middleman, which would be below me, and, and they have their HR department and their accounts department doing all this. In actual fact, I've just been able to do it myself by delegating. As I said, with the, train, with the funding, that we, the money we save, we're actually able to use it very, very flexibly around training that's really tailored to Jacob. Um, I am really, really love doing it this way. There's not a great deal of change. I mean, I suppose in Jacob's life we were already doing something similar. But from my perspective, it's liberating. It really feels like freedom. You know, it's just really, you know, we're, we're all in the driver's seat and, you know, we just sort of kind of can really fit it around Jacob. Next slide. So I'm just got a few points if you're interested in doing this yourself and you wanted to get started as Lorna said start with a vision <laughs> start with a vision if you don't start with a vision you're putting the, the cart before the horse I think it's good to have a really good idea of the type of support that you require or your family member requires so for us the support that Jacob requires particularly most particularly is that support connecting to the community we need people who can do that, who are outgoing, who are confident. Um, it doesn't, we've sort of, I've, I've become rather good at recruiting over a number of years now and um, just because a, a young person or a person that we're, you know, looking at uh, um, employing has lots of friends doesn't necessarily mean they are good at connecting in the, Jacob in the, to the community. We're sort of looking for something beyond being social in your own life. So we particularly look for, but I suppose, Developing a clear idea of what sort of support you need. So we've got social connectors. There's people who might be better at providing personal care. Those two skill set. There are two different skill sets there, and it's good to identify what skill sets are needed for particular tasks. But it's also around payroll help and like finance help. So if, even though that's not directly related to Jacob's support, it's kind of the backroom stuff. It's um you know it's operating in the backrooms that um and I you know I need help with that because I'm not particularly particularly interested in that. I, need, I know it needs to be done. I know it needs to be. I know support workers mu are much happier when they're paid. Um, you know, the government's more happy when they're collecting tax on their behalf. So that's where I sort of there's a role there for the bookkeeper. And of course, I'm really sick of writing rosters. So the support coordinator is really able to help out there, and in, in by me delegating that role. And I, once again, it's finding people who can help you, finding people, bringing your, bringing your crowd around you, bringing in your friends and people who share your vision, whether they're paid or unpaid, bringing them in and, and, um, and, and, and bringing them on the journey with you. And I think Lorna said it, if, it, if you've got naysayers, or what I've often found occasionally come up with people who are sort of, just let me play devil's advocate. I don't need a devil's advocate. <laughs> Bring people who, who, who are like-minded with you. I think the other thing I might just add is, you know, the, um, the benefit of peer support. Um, I was really, really fortunate, I said at the beginning, it's, but we've had a vision for Jacob for a really long time. And sometimes I say I was just really lucky that I fell in with a bad crowd of, um, of, of families when Jacob was quite young and there were families who didn't want what the traditional disability sector was offering and, we, and they were questioners. And I think that if I hadn't fallen in with people like that, then I might not have actually begun to question. So I am actually encourage everybody to sort of hang out with people who who are really, you know, who, who are doing things differently, who do have a vision for their sons and daughters. Hear their stories, hear what people are doing which is different from the, what everybody else, you know, from the traditional disability sector because those stories are the ones that are really will make a difference to your life or your son or daughter's life. So that's just my, my ideas of perhaps where you could get started. Thank you.